Hello, YouTube. For this video, I will be covering Leviticus chapters 9 through 16, or the second part of the Priestly Code. For quotes or paraphrasing of the text in this video, I will be using the online Hebrew interlinear Bible. The link is down below. Starting off this video in Leviticus chapter 9, Aaron and his sons have to stay in the tent of appointment for seven days, and on the eighth day they are allowed to come out. Moses then orders Aaron to go to the tent of appointment and make sacrifices for atonement for himself and his family, and Aaron does as he's told, and a fire goes out from Yahweh to consume the sacrifices. Nadab and Abihu start burning incense Yahweh did not tell them to burn, and Yahweh burns them to a crisp. <laughs> then Moses gets Aaron's other two sons, Eleazar and Ithamar to act as priests in Nadab's and Abihu's stead. Nadab and Abihu were mentioned once in the J-source text, or the Yahwist text, when Moses and Aaron and a group of elders went into the mountain at Sinai in Exodus chapter 24 to pray and see a vision of Yahweh. After Nadab and Abihu die, Moses tells Aaron and his remaining sons not to mourn or drink alcohol. Next, the priestly writer lists the animals that the people of Israel are not allowed to eat. In the book of Deuteronomy, specific examples are mentioned that Israelites are allowed to eat, like the bull, the roebuck, the sheep, the goat, the gazelle, and the antelope, followed by a list of animals that are not allowed to be eaten, which is mostly similar to the list in Leviticus. The Deuteronomist does not mention swarming land creatures at all, and even contradicts the Leviticus writer, by saying in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 19 through 20, to not eat any flying, creeping thing at all, but that clean fowls are okay. While according to Leviticus, every land creature that splits the hoof and chews the cud, every sea creature with fins and scales, and even insects like locusts, crickets, and grasshoppers may all be eaten. Also according to Leviticus, Israelites are also forbidden from eating creatures like weasels, rodents, geckos, and lizards. Next are commands concerning cleaning or disposal of different vessels, which do not appear in Deuteronomy, or the Yahwist or Elohist source for that matter. At what point during the writing of the Torah would the Israelites have considered eating lizards and other creatures crawling on the ground, or grasshoppers and locusts for that matter? Usually, people living in agricultural societies with an abundance of food tend to eat from a narrower variety of potential food sources. In times where there is less abundance of staple foods, people have to become more resourceful and look for alternative food sources. Alternatively, wealthy societies come into contact with alternative food sources from foreign lands through trading, which would mo most likely have occurred for the Kingdom of Judah during the reigns of Kings Hezekiah and Manasseh, under the Assyrian Empire. In Leviticus chapter 12, the writer also gives commands for purification of women after giving birth. The length of time a woman was considered unclean depended on whether the woman had given birth to a boy or a girl. If the woman had given birth to a boy, she was considered unclean for eight days and then had to stay in the blood of her cleansing for 33 more days. If the woman gave birth to a girl, she was unclean for 14 days and had to remain in the blood of her cleansing for 66 more days. In both cases, while she was in the blood of her cleansing, she was not allowed near the sanctuary. After that, the mother was allowed to bring a young ram and a pigeon or turtle dove, or two pigeons or turtle doves to the priest for burnt and sin offerings. This cleanliness custom is pretty unique when compared with the Elohist, Yahwist and Deuteronomist sources, but the writing seems pretty typical for a priestly source document. One ancient Egyptian text also described Prince Kimwaset's wife's menstruation as a time of cleansing. Prince Kimwaset, 
was the second son of Ramses II and crowned prince until he died in the 55th year of his father's reign, at which point Merneptah took over the position and eventually became king of Egypt and erected the Merneptah Steel that first chronicled a distinct group of people called Israel in historical record. In ancient Assyria, women were isolated during menstruation and after childbirth. Ancient Assyrian men, especially priests, avoided physical contact with menstruating women, lest they be contaminated. This was yet another custom that was a product of its time and cultures, as strange as it may seem to modern people. Chapters 13 and 14 of Leviticus go into pretty extensive detail about the diagnosis and treatment of leprosy in the body, on clothing, and in houses. The treatment given for leprosy of the body was pretty much to keep the person in isolation from the community, which was a pretty good idea and pretty much the only option available in ancient times. In fact, there was no drug treatment for leprosy until the 1940s. Of course, the blotches on clothing and in homes were more likely to be mold and mildew. Many scholars have argued that the so-called leprosy in the body described was not actual leprosy at all, but a scaly skin disease similar to leprosy in appearance. Chapter 15 describes cleanliness customs for men and women with running discharges. Once again, such people were told to stay in isolation until their discharge stopped. Then they had to make offerings in order to be completely cleansed. The writers, of course, would have had no concept of the germ theory of disease. All they knew was that people who were exposed to unclean things got sick more frequently, which meant to them that God was unhappy with that person and they needed to do something to make amends. Chapter 16 describes the Day of Atonement procedure priests had to follow once a year. The priest had to sacrifice a young bull for a sin offering. A goat was also to be sacrificed to Yahweh, and another was to be sent into the wilderness as a scapegoat. After the release of the second goat, the priest was to burn incense near the ark and sprinkle the bull's and first goat's blood on the cover of the ark and upon the altar. Afterward, the priest was supposed to wash himself. The only times when the Israelites might have needed to atone for anything, would have felt the need to atone for anything rather, would have been after the Assyrian Empire sacked the Kingdom of Israel, after King Josiah instituted his religious reforms, or when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and took many of its inhabitants into exile. There's little, if anything, in the archaeological record to show when priests began making sin offerings or what the first temple looked like before it was destroyed. I've tried to look for certain key words and phrases in the biblical text to determine when the priestly source was most likely written. The word atonement, for example, appears a bunch of times in Leviticus and Numbers, in one verse in 2 Samuel, and a couple of times in First and Second Chronicles, and once in Nehemiah. So far, all the descriptions given for sacrifices and cleanliness customs are a lot more descriptive than the Yahwist or Eloist sources, and more specific even than the book of Deuteronomy, but less descriptive than verses written by the redactor. There's no mention of leprosy in the Yahwist or Eloist sources, and the only mention of leprosy in Deuteronomy simply instructs the people to consult the Levites and follow their directions. This is the end of the Priestly Code portion of Leviticus. The next couple of videos will cover the verses in Leviticus known by scholars as the Holiness Code. Uh, peace and blessings. Have a nice day.